Yep. And uh, apparently I had the audio shut off on uh, the YouTube <laughs> version here. Oh, wow. So for all the YouTube people, wow, that was awesome. I just looked on down and I'm going, huh, it's not on the air. But yeah, Wanda Kay was a very special lady. I had the opportunity of uh, meeting her when I had a group go out to um, Waverly Hills, Bobby Mackey's, and of course, uh, the Wolf House. So we actually got to hang out with uh, Wanda Kay over at... Uh, Whoa! <laughs> My camera just about almost hit the floor. Um... Yeah, we hung out with her over at uh, Bobby Mackey's for the evening. Uh, very informative uh, lady on some of the history and stuff like that. So, but yeah, heaven's got another angel and she surely will be missed. So, yeah, so keep them in their prayers. Um, also, I had mentioned last week, uh, I have a friend of mine that lives in Puerto Rico and... Uh, she has put on her Facebook, and it's a major concern. We don't see what actually goes on in other countries because we're we based on whatever we see from news, social media, and all that stuff. But it, there's a very dire, straight situation going on in Puerto Rico. Uh, there's a lot of red tape. FEMA has not really. I mean, it's he's, they're there, but they're not there. They're wanting people to come to them, but the problem is there's people all over the island that can't get to them. Right. And so Desiree, which is one of my, my mom, her mom and my mom were good friends. And, um, of course, my mom has passed on, but I still keep up with the family and, the, you know, and everything. And Desiree has... Uh, uh, started cleaning out her garage and she's asking for donations mail them to her doesn't care if it's deodorant or toothpaste or any of those things um, she even had asked for uh, plastic bags because in Puerto Rico the plastic bags like Walmart bags Kroger bags and stuff like that are actually banned in Puerto Rico because they don't have a landfill all their trash has to be exported wow. from the island so she literally one lady had sent her and wadded up as many bags as they possibly could and shipped her donations of bags and she asked all of her neighbors and everything and she got like three to four hundred plastic bags in those plastic bags she is putting like I said personal hygiene items um, because they, they don't have anything open down there and they don't have much of a relief down there she's also started a fundraiser campaign uh, it's a fund me account I've shared it on my page and I've and Gavin's got it on his page and her goal is to reach five thousand dollars what she's planning to do with those five thousand dollars is to try to order stuff from the United States hopefully Amazon can ship to her so far she it takes her about a week she said maybe a little over a week to get something from Amazon to her house and that's even with her paying the rush delivery and so every little bit will help I, if anybody wants to just do a personal donation as in products or something private message me and I'll give you her address um, so like I said anything that helps I mean like there's no feminine hygiene products so especially the ladies that's seeking mother nature at that time of the month yeah, that's not happening in Puerto Rico. Yes, wow. I mentioned that on the air. Yes, you did. <laughs> Band-Aids. Yes, you did. Al rubbing alcohol. Uh, sponges. I mean, they've actually, Desiree and her little eight-year-old son has even went and visited a nursing home to where they are surviving off of the minimum of what they possibly can get there. And she keeps me updated. Um, I'm hoping to grab pictures from her and post them on my page. And I'm going to tag Gavin into them to show you just exactly what the conditions are. Because the news, the media, the government, everything is not really showing you what they are experiencing. People are committing suicide just so that, you know, if they have a family and it's a wife and three kids and the father, the father's willing to commit suicide to... Uh, uh, take it as one less mouth to feed. 
for that family. That's sad. And, and, I mean, people are actually killing themselves for the fact that they don't have nothing left. Their house is gone. Anything of their worth and value is gone. Um, Some of them has lost their wives. Some of them has lost their children. Um, There is places that they still can't get to that bodies have not been counted because they've restricted the roads because travel is not safe to certain areas of the island because they're afraid that if people do go over there and start looking for people they're afraid that they're not going to be they're going to lose their lives too so body counts have not been fully claimed and the numbers are a whole lot higher than what they are saying on the news so it's very important that you know I was told her I was going to get this message out to her on, on our podcast, and I and I feel sorry for Puerto Rico, and keep Puerto Rico in your prayers, and if you guys can contribute, even if it's just one dollar, at least that dollar can help pay for maybe shipping or handling or something to get something to her, because she has turned her garage into a warehouse. Um, wow. Yeah, it's kind of... It's kind of sad. That's kind of bad. Yes, it is. And so that's a personal heartstring to my heart right now, and and mm-hmm. I'm willing to help with as much as I can for her. Um, on going on to the other link. Um, today in history, I throw a little history note in there today. Um, in 1867, on this day. You, the U.S. takes possession of Alaska. Now, Alaska is about the twice the size of the state of Texas. Damn. I don't know if we have any Texas listeners out there. We might have some Alaskan listeners out there. Any Texas listeners out there, give us a thumbs up in the Facebook chat. After purchasing the territory from Russia, you know they gave $7.2 million for Alaska. And what year was this? This is in 1867. This is just a couple of years after the Civil War. How on earth did they come up with seven point, what, two, two million? million dollars. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong or not, but did they print money by hand? Yes, they used, they, yes. They and were, they printed up seven point two million dollars. Well, I don't know if physically, if per hand... If uh, a bank note was signed or if it was actually... It was an IOU. An <laughs> IOU. Well, I guess it could be um, an so IOU. I just don't really see how the United States actually had that type of money back in the 1800s. Oh, yeah. I just don't foresee that happening. I mean, heck, they thought back in the Wild West days, a dollar was like 50 to to $100 dollars. And you're saying in the latter 1800s, uh, $7.2 million? Did they even know what million dollars was back then? I don't know. I mean, it was basically two cents of an acre. If you want to break it down to a scenario, it was actually two cents per acre. So, I mean... That's just yeah. nuts. And, of course, if you, you want to get into more of a time period, President Andrew Johnson was the president at that time. I'd like to go ahead and research and see how much the United States actually had in currency during that time. Well, it also makes you think, I mean, I know that we've all had, I know we have had a deficit, and our deficit has grown very, very extremely high. Oh, yeah. And and we have, you know... Wasn't that thanks to Clinton? <laughs> I don't know. Everybody blames one president over another. I, I don't get in politics, especially what? on our podcast. When did the but I'm thinki- deficit actually start? I don't know. I don't know. The deficit, did it start during? I'm thinking it started because, you know, it, it really started showing up during the Civil War because I think we almost went bankrupt Okay. during the Civil War. But Anybody I mean, agree with that? But I'm thinking, you know, because I know that we had several major stock markets. We went through depression. We've went through uh, different types of democracy that we have all established. And, you know, we've all, every president that has been in office has tackled some kind of war. If it wasn't a personal war, a political war, an actual combat war. But every president has faced something. Hmm. So, I, I don't know. Interesting. Which would be something for everybody to look up and possibly uh, hit us up on Messenger and tell us what you found out. And also, yeah. Yeah. Because it's interesting. And I might, you know, 
That, that's just a dawning fact, you know. $7.2 million in 1867. I don't even have $7.2 million in my checking account. Do you have some mystery money hiding in yours? I have an offshore account. <laughs> but anyway. But, um, yeah, that, that's interesting history fact. Um, moving on. Thought I'd let you know. The wedding dress has been ordered. I went for my fitting yesterday. Was not happy with my fitting yesterday. But I went. The dress will be in January. I get to go try it on. Interesting. We'll hmm. find out. Um, but that's enough on that tidbit. Stranger for the Strange. I came up with something called Stranger for the Strange. And here is the question of the night for Stranger of the Strange. Oh boy, here we go. What does poker... Foosball and pole dancing. <laughs> what does those three things have in common? Anybody have an answer for that? How about you, Jim and Tammy? You got an answer answer for that? There are a group in uh, YouTube over there in the chat. I see. Although we got a lot of people over here, we got Rhonda, we got Jennifer, we got Rebecca, we got Greg, we got Kaylee, uh, Justin. We got a whole bunch of folks in here this evening. We got Patrick. Haven't heard from Patrick Johnson in a long time. So, anybody got an answer to that question she just gave? I'm stumped. I have no idea. What does poker, foosball, and pole dancing have in common? Yeah, makes you wonder. <laughs> Foosball's the <laughs> devil. Oh. What do you got? Oh, I, I, a pole. <laughs> a pole. <laughs> a pole. Oh wow. Okay. Well, you all can go ahead and ponder on that question, and uh, we'll see what you guys come up with. But uh, as I stated earlier tonight, we're going to be joined by the Colorado Paratech founder and the godfather of Ghostlight, Mr. Rich Horn, in about four minutes. Um, I don't know if you guys know about the ghost lights, but I have heard that they are dominating the market for IR illuminators. Uh, basically, it allows all of our ghost hunters to be able to see in far distance in the dark. So that's really cool. I mean, there's a lot of uh, illuminators out there that basically um, you're able to see a certain distance. But these ghost lights, I mean, they're they're unbelievable. From what I have seen, it's incredible. You're able to see <laughs> so much. Sarah Stream says, a man invented them. Oh, I love it. It is awesome. That does sound about right. I guess I can go <laughs> ahead and give the answer. I'll go ahead and give the answer. Okay. What happens in 2020? Are we even going to be here in 2020? Well, it's already 2017. I know. we got three more years. What's going to happen? They in are really good. We have several... Oh. You have an e-probe. Oh. Okay. Go ahead. Anyway, um, in 2020 is the next set of Summer Olympics. And they're trying to make foosball, poker, <laughs> and ball dancing as an event in the Olympics. And for pole dancing, we have blah, blah, blah to win the gold medal. Are you serious? <laughs> gold medal, <laughs> silver medal, and bronze medal for oh, pole dancing. Oh, it gets better. Oh, dear God. In order for them to establish it, it has to be an event in 75 countries. <laughs> oh, Jesus. But it has to be ranked for both sexes. So a man has to learn how to pole dance as same as a woman has to learn how to pole dance. We going to get a competition for fair game. Same way for foosball, same way for poker. I just can't see a guy pole dancing. <laughs> uh, that just doesn't even sound right. Wow. Yeah. So it makes you pond on it, you know. I, I read that article and I was like, men? They said 75 countries had to have a man pole dancing and 40 countries. This is the discrimination Ooh. part of it. Sorry, guys. This is the discrimination part of it. They wanted 75 countries to do pole dancing 
men had to be doing 75% and women gets 40%? Seriously? All right. Well, you all go ahead and ponder that for a while. Let that sink in. That And a bunch of OMGs are going like, to go around. But we're going to go ahead and get Mr. Rich Horn on the phone here so we can talk more about these uh, ghost lights and uh, find out some more information on them. It's a ringing. Hey. Hey, good evening, Rich. How are you doing? <laughs> good. How are you doing? Uh, we're hanging in there. We're hanging in there. We're uh, boasting about your lights there. They're being, like, totally cool and dominating the uh, IR illumination market. So that's pretty cool. Oh, thanks. Oh, you're welcome. So go ahead and tell our listeners and viewers, uh, you know, who you are and what uh how what you're doing <laughs> in other words <laughs> what the hell it is that i do yeah there you go um, that's well, it <laughs> <laughs> i'm uh i'm rich horn i founded colorado paratech uh way back before electricity and uh and uh, at some point uh i got into uh dabbling and in trying to invent things that could be useful in the paranormal field mm -hmm. and uh I uh, really ended up coming back to uh, illumination. That's, that's always been a passion of mine because I like to do video and, and take pictures and things. Mm -hmm. And I could never find anything that would work well in dark settings. Right. Um, so so I, I basically tried out all the illuminators that were available at the time when I started doing this, and nothing performed to where I wanted it to be. So mm -hmm. I just took it upon myself to start making these for myself and um, and for what I do. And and have constantly tried to evolve the science and, and uh, push the boundaries and, and make them stronger and brighter and lighter and smaller and and make them useful um, and something that was dependable and, and could get good illumination and that and that's really what got started with ghost lights and then friends wanted them and then friends of friends and you know it was one of those things where it just snowballed right. now they sell worldwide. Oh yeah, they're, and, uh, they're excellent too. <laughs> one of the cooler things, one of the one of the things I'm proud of is I don't I don't just do um, IR illuminators. I do a, all kinds of lights, everything from white light and beyond. Uh, but I've got there's an outfit uh, in Africa that uh, does anti poaching. They basically stock poachers and, and capture them on video and arrest them. Oh wow! And they use go they use ghost lights for doing that. <laughs> because they can actually see farther distance. Yeah, they can they can see them before they can see the poachers before the poachers can see them. So give me a ballpark figure about what is the farthest distance one of your lights can actually uh, project light out to. Well, uh, what I'm working on now is a 60 watt light, which will get over 300 yards. Wow, that's like almost the entire hull of the. Uh, USS Lexington. Yeah, I guess. I'm not sure how long that thing is. But I imagine that sounds about right. Yeah, we were actually using uh, phantom lights uh, when we were at the USS Lexington. And unfortunately, it was like only maybe 10 feet in front of us was bright. And you're able to see anything beyond that. It was just dark. So uh, Yeah. We had to keep adding more and more. I mean, there were times when we had a rig that had like four uh, phantom lights on it just to expand the uh, the distance for us to actually see. Wow. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. And then I decided, well, you know what? I'm going to try to build my own too. That was a mistake. You know, get solder <laughs> all over your fingers and drill the wrong holes in the plastic casing or they don't line up. Oh, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it can be a lot of work. But it's a lot of fun for me. So. Oh yeah, something I love. To, something I love doing. So, um, what got you into the paranormal? Um, well, that's kind of a that's a, a common question. I get that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, actually, started a long time ago when I was a kid. Um, I was born in Germany and was an army brat, and I lived over there till I was about twelve. And as a kid, um, the USO used to take uh, children of of enlisted men on tours during the summer. We'd go to castles and we'd go on Rhine River cruises and, and all these cool places. And uh, 
and and I'm I've never really had any weird creepy feelings anywhere we ever went. We've gone into dungeons and you know different places, battlefields and stuff, mm-hmm. and I never felt anything. But one summer uh, they took us to Dachau concentration camp, and I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with that. But during World War II, the Nazis used Dachau as an extermination camp for the Jews and oh. political prisoners. Yeah, and they just killed millions of people there. And as a kid, we it was you know most of the camp or a lot of the camp was still there at this time. This was in the 60s, and uh, from the moment we crossed the threshold of the gate, it's I mean it was just a nice spring day, everything was fine, mm-hmm. and we crossed into that thing, and and it's like somebody hit a light switch. It was just dark, it had dark feeling and gloomy and oppressive, and you felt like you were being watched and. And I'd never experienced anything like this as a kid. I'd never had any idea there was anything outside my own Existence. person. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, it just had no idea that there was more to life than what I had experienced as a kid. But when I did, when I went to this place, everything changed. And this is a feeling that stuck with me my whole life. And once we were done and we left there and w- crossed the threshold of the gate again and got on the bus to leave, it was like somebody flipped the light back on. And it was, I felt fine. I didn't feel anything, and and it was just like a weird dream, and that's what that's really what got the ball rolling. That's what got me started. It sounds like something uh, Paula experienced once. Where was that at? You kind of experienced something like that. It's a sense of dread and someone like watching you and you kind of like look over your shoulder. Yeah, we've had that at a couple of locations. Which one? Um. Well, I felt like a little bit of dread when I was at Mel. Well. It wasn't really like over the shoulder type thing. It's just when you were in a room and you went to one side of the room, you just felt like you didn't when you didn't feel like you belong there. And right. and it just made you feel like you were completely out of place and you felt like you were invading someone's privacy even though nobody mm-hmm. lived there for a long period of time. Yeah. And that was up in the attic of Melbourne Manor, which we will be talking oh, about yeah. here later on tonight. <laughs> yeah. That one attic is just you want you don't want to go up there by yourself and especially in the dark. <laughs> so, but uh, your lights have basically come a long way. I saw a timeline that was going from let's see when what was the year? Was it like nineteen ninety nine? Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. I think is is when I put the first lights out. Okay, yeah, it has a little timeline that shows the progression of each light. So when you have, I've seen that you have some that has like six lights in it and four lights, but then you're you got like two lights. So is the two lights more powerful than the four and six? Um, well, there's different types. There's um, the the most common IRs you'll see out there, uh, basic ones use t- uh, five or ten millimeter LEDs. They're small plastic bulbs that look, look kind of like a, a dome shaped thing that protrudes out. And uh, in fact, your uh, your phantom lights; those have five watt or five millimeter LEDs in them. Mm-hmm. So they're they're small little diodes to put out IR light. Um, I make those uh, my ADV series, the advanced series lights. I make those uh, available for for something that's more affordable because they're they're cheaper to make, and uh, and a lot of people like them just for doing a weekend warrior thing. You know, if you don't want to invest a lot of money in a rig, um, those are perfect for that kind of thing. Um, but the uh, the high the pro series lights use high powered LEDs. They require a special battery to run. Um, it's a rechargeable lithium ion battery. And I first started experimenting with these things back about 2010, and I finally got a, a good viable uh, model in 2012. And they're, the, the light these things put out is just phenomenal. It's it's way above what a standard uh, 10 millimeter LED can do. Mm-hmm. They require more power, but they put off real smooth illumination. You don't get that hot spot effect in the middle of the screen, like a, it looks like a spotlight. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just far superior to a normal LED. But they, there's it's a lot of work to get them to work in a portable setting. Uh, they were really designed to use in stuff like uh, security equipment that's permanently mounted and fed AC power to. Mm-hmm. So it took a lot of research and a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of trial and error to to get these things where they w- could be portable and used in portable settings, and so and lot small enough and light enough to carry around on your camera, rather than having to lug a car battery around with you. <laughs> so right. um, that's uh, really the number of LEDs is it varies with the need with the person's need. I try to make a, a wide range of lights so that. 
uh, you have a lot to choose from. Some people don't need all the power. They do small work or they do a lot of close-in work or they mm -hmm. do selfie cam type stuff with IR lights and smaller lights and less light and lights that have variable output on them or, or what you want for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of people work outside like hunting, Sasquatch or UFOs and that type of thing. And outside you need all the IR you can get because it has to it's like any light, it has to bounce off of a reflective surface and come back to the camera to cause illumination. Mm -hmm. So the more IR in an outside setting, the better. So um, that's the that's why you see the Pro Series that have, you know, two, four, six, mm -hmm. eight, ten, whatever um, LEDs on them, because that's just to increase the amount of LED, uh, IR power going out so that you get a good illumination in a wide setting or something like Waverly Hills that has these huge halls right. that go on forever. Mm -hmm. Well, this... This allows you to see down to the end of the hall so you know what you're looking at. That's one of my biggest problems with with uh, people's uh, video in, the, in video and camera and photos in uh, the paranormal field is there's a whole lot of under-illuminated mm -hmm. um, of things that are presented as evidence. Right. And you don't know what you're looking at because you can't see a clear picture of it. Um, with more illumination, you can actually see what's in the field of vision mm -hmm. and, and discern is if it's a person walking back past the end of the hall on his way to the bathroom or if it's some you know shadow figure or something like that. Right. If you don't have proper illumination, you can't tell for sure. So you just you just make it up in your head. Well, then that's a shadow figure or no, that's John. He's heading to the bathroom. Right. Yeah. So with the proper illumination, you can tell there's no guesswork, and that and that was really my goal with with creating guest lights because I was I found so much stuff in my films that I thought, hey, I got something here, mm -hmm. and then later to find out, no, that was something else. Well, I'd say, well, if I have the proper illumination, I won't be guessing so much. You know what I mean? So yeah, exactly. So the, the increase in the number of LEDs is proportional to the amount of output power. Okay, I'm actually looking at the GL6 Pro TFS True Spec uh, hmm. Full Spectrum. True full spectrum, yeah. Yeah, would that actually have the distance to cover, like, say, the death tunnel at Waverly Hills to go from the top all the way down to the bottom? Well, how far is that? Uh, I think it's. I, mean, like, I want to say. I've never been there. Oh, I want to say it's like, uh, what do they say, 500 feet? I think it's. Mm, probably not that one. I could build one that would do that. Um, basically, you would get about maybe 150 feet out of the 10 watt version of that. Okay. Maybe a little more. Okay. Yeah, because uh, that thing is actually 500 feet, and it would be awesome to actually have a light you can put on your camera and just shine mm. it straight down from the top all the way down to the bottom, and you'll be able to see anything that's inside that tunnel because. Normally, when you're using your lights, you're only getting like maybe 100, well, actually 62, maybe 75 feet with different mm -hmm. lights. And you really can't see what's going on all the way down at the end. And, and that's the reason why a lot of people are like, oh, I hear scratching or I hear footsteps or um, I hear voices. But they don't really understand that on the far end of the death tunnel, it's mm -hmm. open. That's the wildlife. <laughs> right. Yeah. So they have this huge door that's down there. That's where they go ahead and drop the bodies off to, uh, you know, the, the car that takes them off to the morgue or wherever it takes them. But, yeah. Right. But I've been looking yeah, at Yeah, well, I've, I've got a couple of the larger IRs would definitely hit that. Um, say the 40, 45 watt or the 60 watt would definitely hit that. Uh, the true full spectrum, I could make it in that, in that size, mm -hmm. and it would do that. The thing about the true full spectrum, though, is it's... Uh, it has visible light, so it's it's the actual all the visual spectrum that we can see, mm -hmm. plus IR and UV extended on both ends. Right. So you get a you get a uh, an illuminated scene. So when you turn that on, it's kind of like a flashlight, although the visual light is subdued, mm -hmm. and you get more IR and more UV through. So it gives it a, a very interesting look, and it does make things pop out that don't you don't normally see with just white light. So. Uh, if you use something like that, it would be, I could make one that would light that whole place up. But but it would be visual light, something to keep in mind if mm -hmm. you're using a true full spectrum. It's gonna you're gonna be able to see the light. Yeah, we've been uh, whenever we do our investigation, we actually actually trying to use full spectrum because you're able to see the full spectrum from UV to visible to IR, which is a lot oh, okay. better than just IR. So we're actually using a lot of full spectrum during our episodes and stuff because, yes, like you just said, 
more things will pop out that we normally can't see where the IR can't pick it up either. Mm -hmm. So, but I do have one question that um, it really kind of drives me nuts and just, you know, puts me out in left field. IR mm -hmm. lights, will your lights wash out a laser grid? Um, they can, yeah. It depends on the power of the laser grid and the color. Mm -hmm. uh, different colors show up differently. Because the IR lights that we have used washed out the red uh, grid from Ghost Stop, mm -hmm. and it also washed out the uh, laser grid from the pen, which is green. Right. And a green will usually um, show up better. Uh, one of the advantages of the Pro Series lights is they do have a variable output on them. Mm -hmm. So you can turn it down and until your laser grid pops through. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, because we actually lost, uh, we saw what was going on. Um, uh -huh. We were at a cemetery called, uh, oh gosh, Asbury Cemetery. It's supposed to be like the most haunted cemetery in Kentucky. And oh. I, I set up a laser grid facing a bunch of tombstone. And I kid you not, we saw two figures coming toward us through the grid. And when I moved my camera over to actually grab it because I'm like I cannot believe what I'm seeing Paula saw it I'm like mm -hmm. do you see that and she's like yes all of a sudden I moved my camera whoosh, wipe washed it completely out I'm like oh, oh man and oh. It, it was awesome I mean nobody would believe that we saw two figures coming through there and we saw I saw it first I hit her I go are you seeing what I'm seeing and she says yes and then right when I moved my freaking camera over it washed it all out I was like ha ha uh, so yeah live and learn I guess <laughs> yeah that's it would have helped to have a, uh, an output control on that you could have dialed it back mm-hmm yeah but the phantom lights don't have uh, any variable controller on it it's just basically mm -hmm. turn it on and on or that's off it. Yeah. yeah and I've tried their UV ones they came out with these UV ones called UV flare and right uh, it's not really bright and you really have to like put it up against a wall just to really see it I'm like oh my god yeah uv is is a different uh oh where'd you go i think we lost him where'd he go we've lost him he we don't even have the connector up there anymore i see that oh well, that was weird i'm gonna go ahead and call him back i don't know what happened there I got cut off, he said. We're trying to get you back. We're calling you back, Gritch. Wow, that was bizarre. I haven't seen it that ever drop before. I've never seen that happen before. Well, we always have some kind of strange thing happens every week on our podcast. I guess. Huh? Did I dial the right number? try it again that's weird I've never had this thing actually drop a call before no, let's try it again I mean I just tried to call and it just rang and rang and rang that's really weird and now it's just ringing well that's weird You got anything on your uh, phone there? Rich, the phone is just ringing. Hi, thanks for calling Colorado Paratech. <laughs> We're unable to pick up the phone right now, okay, so now if you'll leave your name, voicemail. a brief message, and your phone number, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks for calling. Well, we're Here's calling. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Hey, Rich, good evening. This is Gavin Kelly. We're trying to call you. Uh... It just rang and rang and rang and it went to your voicemail. So, I'm not sure what's going on. We've never ever had our phone system drop a call before, but uh, it might be on your end. I'm not sure. But uh, hit, hit us up, uh, shoot us a message, and uh, we'll go ahead and call you back.
Wow, that is really bizarre. I've, I've never seen that happen before. So, but anyway, um, check for you your guys. Check your messages. Call my cell. Call, hold on. Check your messages. Check my messages. Oh, boy. Let's see what we got here. I got to close this out. All right. We're going to go ahead and give him a call on his cell phone. Give me a second here. We're going to... That was really bizarre. We're going to try this again. I guess so. <laughs> I left you a voicemail, though. Hey there. Wow, <laughs> that was that was um rather weird. Well, there it is. You know, the paranormal wor world strikes back. <laughs> I guess. That, I mean, we've never had a phone call drop. I mean, it just went dead, and I'm like, huh. I, I think it's on my end. That's I what think we uh, I've been having trouble with my landline here. Ah, okay. Because when I went ahead and called back, it went, it rang and rang and rang and rang, and then it went to voicemail. <laughs> I know. I picked it up, and all I got was a busy signal. So. <laughs> and I think it's my end. Oh wow! So sorry about that. That's all right. Well, go ahead and tell our listeners uh, and viewers where they can uh, find these awesome uh, ghost lights. Uh, give them a website. Uh, and how they can contact you so they can uh, purchase their own uh, ghost light night visions uh, lights. Well, sure. You bet. You can find them on Amazon.com. Um, you can find them on eBay. Um, and you can go to our website, which is ghostlightco.com. That's G-H-O-S-T-L-I-G-H-T-C-O, as in Colorado, dot com. And uh, be happy to help anybody out, answer any questions. Uh, I've been researching this stuff for nine years almost now and uh, and know a lot about uh, working with night vision and that kind of thing. So if anybody just wants to ask some questions about some stuff, I'm happy to answer them. You know, you don't have to shop with me, but I'll help you out as best I can. That's awesome. Do you do any uh, events where you take your lights and show them off at like a Paracon or a Comic-Con? Um, I don't do many cons. I mean, I, I've I've done some local events. Uh, basically, most of the local events I do are uh, public uh, investigations that are for charity for the location involved. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, I do a lot of work with uh, the Abbey down in Canyon City, which is a huge monastery. That's a beautiful place, but in in bad shape, and uh, so we do a lot of, uh, of stuff down there to try to raise money to save the roof and that type of thing. And uh, so we do, when I do public events, I show off my stuff, but I, I don't really go around trying to, to sell them at the cons and things. I just mm -hmm. sell online. Or if somebody, you know, gets a hold of me in person or uh, is at an event that I'm at and is interested, I'll help them out. Yeah, we actually uh, were at one uh, Paracon and we had our Phantom Lights out there and we had a couple of people saying that they use uh, ghost lights and have we heard of them? And do we have any and I'm like no we we don't have any ghost light we've been looking at them but we don't have any yet and he's like well yeah man they're really cool and then he wanted to bring in his other friend over he's like yeah we can like stand right here and just shoot it straight all the way down the hall and you'd be able to see anything someone jump out from the corner and I'm like oh wow <laughs> oh that's awesome yeah so, I'm glad people are getting good use out of them oh yeah well I've seen a video of someone that took uh at ashmore estates they were outside in the yard and they mm -hmm. were showing i think it was robin terry he was doing it with his uh, tablet or maybe a camera i'm not sure what it was but yeah actually i think he was taking a picture with or a video with his phone of his camcorder using the light right <laughs> and first of all he turned his regular one on and it was like it barely even reached the front door and all of a sudden, you turn your lights on, and it's like, boom, the whole building was in focus. I'm like, wow, now that's impressive. <laughs> and and that's why I made those, because I want to see that. You know, I want to mm -hmm. be able to see something light up entirely. And and that's the whole impetus for me doing this and, and mm -hmm. keep doing it and keep trying to evolve newer and better lights. Because... Uh, it, you just you have to see what's going on. You have to have a clear picture mm -hmm. uh, in your camera to really know what's going on and take the guesswork out. 
Oh yeah, most definitely, most definitely. So, well, hey man, I tell you what, we do appreciate you being on the show and uh, telling all our listeners and viewers about the uh, ghost lights, and of course, going in depth detail on some of the lights. You know, the sixty watts, the ones mm -hmm. that you're uh, currently working on, and uh, you know, just going. Uh, explaining more about the uh, full spectrum light because i know there's a lot of people out there that use full spectrum lighting just like we do um mm -hmm. it, it was kind of funny the first full spectrum light we ever got it had ir lights then it had green leds it had red leds and then it had blue leds and they were trying to pass it as full spectrum lighting i don't see how that's even possible well, it's not true full spectrum lighting, but it's it's got multi spectrum, I guess. Uh -huh. you could say. And, and it's horrible so. looking. I mean, it makes everything all blue and green, and it it doesn't turn like the full spectrum lighting normally is, where it turns everything like kind of purple and stuff. I mean, it was just yeah. weird, colorful, and it would shimmer too, which is really weird. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, because some some colors don't play well with other colors when there's mm -hmm. an absence of the colors in between. That's one of the problems with using a a multi-spectrum light like that. Mm -hmm. um, and even and even in IR, you know, the, the traditional quote full spectrum light, which is just IR and UV and nothing else, mm -hmm. uh, I make those too. Um, but it tends the IR far outpowers the UV to the camera anyway, and we can see the UV, but mm -hmm. we can't see the IR, but the camera sees the IR way more than it sees the UV. So it just overpowers the UV, and you get some really weird anomalies going on unless you balance it out. Right. Um, but with the true full spectrum, you actually get the complement of full of all the colors, and in natural light, you're seeing all the colors. So, so it looks natural. You don't get that weird pulsing effect and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. true full spectrum gives you what you normally see and beyond and and none of that weirdness because there's missing spectrums right so on your lights do you actually have a version where you have ir uv and full spectrum where you can like just push a switch and and activate those lights i do i, I don't uh, have one that i put out publicly but uh, well in effect i do because uh, I made a, a series for the GoPros mm -hmm. called called the Stacker, which I haven't even put up on the website yet. I've just uh, just been playing with them myself. Mm -hmm. But basically, it's a it's a little 10 watt IR, and then it can it's uh, got GoPro connections top and bottom with a quick clip, so you can dock another light on top of it, and another one on top of that, and even put your camera on top of that. So you can put a 10 watt IR, a 10 watt UV, and a 10 watt full spectrum mm -hmm. um, all together and run them all at the same time if you want. Yeah, that's what I was wondering because I mean you could actually go ahead and turn IR on and you can also use the full spectrum lighting at the same time just cancel out the UV or you can just do full spectrum and UV. But I was just wondering if you could actually do that. But uh, we do have a oh, question yeah. in the chat room here uh, on YouTube. Do you have to have a special camera to use a full spectrum light? You do for for the traditional one, the one that's UV or IR. You need one that's been modified and had its uh, filters removed. Full spectrum cameras are just normal cameras that have had their IR and UV UV filters taken out, so that it can see IR and UV light as well. Um, but the true full spectrum light you can use with any camera. You don't it doesn't have to be modified. Oh, cool. The, the big difference the big difference is a modified camera, one that's had that can see IR and UV. We'll see more of the IR and UV um, in the true full spectrum, but even a normal camera will we'll see a small amount of IR and a small amount of UV in the, in the true full spectrum. So you do get you do get some of the benefit of the true full spectrum with any camera. There you go, Jim and Tammy. That uh, help you out there. <laughs> I was kind of wondering that myself because uh, I actually have a few uh, IR cameras and. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it works with the full spectrum lighting, so it winds up turning everything purple, which is uh, right. So it's kind of weird because the camera is IR. The camera is not really quote unquote uh, full spectrum. It's just IR. Uh -huh. So when you use the lighting, well then it turns to full spectrum. Right. So, but that's probably what they were getting at. <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> Once again, we do appreciate you being on the show, and uh, 
you know, giving all, everybody your information and stuff. And I'm going to go ahead and put some links uh, down in the YouTube page so people can actually go to the uh, website and go ahead and purchase some lights from you so that way they can uh, extend their uh, vision in the dark. Well, that'd be great. And again, if you just have questions, feel free to contact me. I don't have to sell you something to talk to you. Right. You know, <laughs> I, lo I love talking this stuff. So anybody has any questions, you know, concerns, whatever, you just want to know more about it, give me a holler. I'll talk to you. All right, then. Well, we do appreciate it. And uh, you have yourself a great rest of the evening. Well, thank you, Gavin. It was great talking to you. And you too, Paula. Thanks. Hey, same here. <laughs> have a good one. All right, you too. See All ya. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you go, folks. Uh, we had Rich Horn, which is the founder of the Colorado Paratech and, of course, the godfather of ghost lights. So if you guys have any questions, uh, just go ahead and hit him up on Facebook, Rich Horn. And like he stated, he'll be more than happy to go ahead and answer any questions for you. And... Uh, Go ahead and get a ghost light in your hands. In the meantime, I am going to get Mr. Josh Hurd on the phone. Okay, well, he's trying to get him on the phone. I'm going to throw out the pitch about the fun, uh, Desiree's fundraiser. The links are on, his, on Gavin's Facebook and again on my Facebook. Uh, she's trying to raise money for a good cause. Uh, Puerto Rico is in dire straits. Uh, our country is not supporting like they're supposed to. We're only seeing a fraction of what's going on really down there. And uh, it's important. If you want to get more with me on one-to-one, -one, I'll tell you more personal stuff that's going on on that island or the country. And uh, like I said, Desiree lives there. Her husband's a doctor at the hospital. And she says... It's just bad all the way around, and and the news and the media is not showing exactly what's going down. That's showing the suicides and the abuse. Malvern Man is going to be your baby. You're going to enjoy yeah, that. Yeah, but it's also going to be kind of both of our. Hello, brothers. hello, 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 Josh. How are you doing this evening? What's up, brother? Uh, not much. We're just hanging in there. We are excited to go ahead and talk about the Malvern Manor and give you some uh, ideas of what we actually captured there. But before we do, go ahead and tell our listeners and our viewers who you are and uh, what you do at the Malvern Manor. Yeah, so uh, my name is Josh Hurd. I'm a paranormal author, lecturer, uh, documentary filmmaker, and investigator. Um, I guess I'm also the chief cook and bottle washer over at Malvern Manor <laughs> over in <laughs> Malvern, Iowa. So. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, man. That's a heck of a label. That's, that's a lot of hats. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is a lot of hats. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, my God. Malvern Manor, man, that place is truly incredible. Shadow Hallway, the attic where... Paula does not even want to go up there by herself. Yeah. I hate going up there by myself, man. <laughs> Why is it you hate going up there by yourself? What, 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 what are you actually feeling when you go up there? Dude, I tell you what. Um, usually myself, and I, I always tell people this. Like, I'm good for about, like, 15 to 20 minutes mm -hmm. on my own up there. Um, and I will start to feel, like, physically sick. Yep. Um like uh almost like a nauseous type feeling now and this is not just me i mean other people have experienced this as well even during like uh just regular walk through tours oh wow we have had people um quite literally toss their cookies oh uh on a tour you know what i'm saying like it's it gets pretty intense every once in a while so well i know when we were up there we had a, a laser grid with a, a motion detector and we place it in the middle of the floor and I put a digital recorder on top of it. And we were sure. sitting far enough away and that dang thing was shooting off. And basically, whenever the motion, it detects motion, it actually fires off the laser in that direction. And it was mainly, oh, nice. it was mainly going for that area where Richard Rose left the uh, his offerings on the floor. Yep, absolutely. So wh wh yep. what's the story with that corner? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because 
on the if, as you like walk up the steps if you look off to the the far left mm -hmm. um back in that area there's that weird crawl space area um back there and that's where i heard the majority of like uh, the growling and the scratching and uh, the disembodied voices telling me to you know uh, f off or do whatever right um now i've also heard the exact same voice um in the exact same setting um in session ask me and practically beg me for alcohol and cigarettes <laughs> um which judging by you know we do have a nice little pile of, <laughs> of offerings over in that yep. opposite corner over there um you know it's it's interesting to me it's almost like classic addictive behavior you know what i mean i don't want you around get away from me uh but before you go <laughs> before you go uh give me a smoke or whatever um you know, like it is what it is but i mean so i i do my best to accommodate mm -hmm. <laughs> as yeah. as much as possible so if i ever have an empty bottle or uh, an extra cigarette or something like that i'll definitely put it up there sounds like someone is bipolar yeah let's back absolutely yeah well let's back up a second um for people that does not know who what melvin manor is can you explain what melvin manor was or and what has it become of as of today yeah, absolutely. So, um, what we now know as Malvern Manor um, was built um, actually in the it was the 1870s. We know it was the fourth structure that was constructed in the actual town. So, um, literally, the town is kind of popping up around this place um, while it was fully functional as a hotel initially. Um, we know it functioned as a hotel all the way up until the 1950s. Um, when it became uh, what we would consider like a nursing home type setting. Um, now, we also know that the nursing home didn't last very long. Um, in the 1970s, the state of Iowa came in and said, oh, your hallways aren't wide enough to support transporting beds and patients um, in the correct manner. And so that's pretty much when you know the nursing home went bye-bye and in comes... Uh, the most fascinating part of history for me personally is when it became, you know, what we would consider like a group home. Now, the group home was catering to um, any type of mental disorder you could possibly fathom, everything from people with Down syndrome, uh, people with alcoholism, mm -hmm. very, very common type diseases that we see on the daily basis, um, to very, very exotic cases of uh, multiple personality or DID, I believe is what they call it now. Mm -hmm. um, even schizophrenia, um, even murderers were housed here. So this is a very odd population of people kind of coexisting under the same roof. And it's definitely almost unheard of by today's standards. Um, so it's very, very interesting. The, the clientele um, that was, that was in this place Um I kind of chalk that up to the fact that, you know, Malvern and, and the people of Malvern, it's a very small town with a really big heart. And I, I think they just didn't want to turn anybody away. Uh, they wanted to help as many people as they possibly could. Um, whether that type of mentality kind of bit them in the butt later on in life, uh, that's anybody's guess. I don't know. Um, but I do chalk that up to why the clientele was the way it was. So, on some of the stories that is told about Melvin Manor, um, tell me about the captain. <laughs> so, the captain. Uh, captain Colors was his name. He was actually one of the original owners of the building. Um, now, also coincidentally, he was one of the first people to really come to the town, uh, settle there, build a family and a life, and really put down roots. So, he has very very strong ties uh, not only to the community itself but to to the building as well um, most people are running into that gentleman or at least a gentleman's spirit referring to himself as the captain up on the second floor uh, right by room 24 and usually they're greeted with a disembodied voice um, usually an EVP of some sort some people are getting punched in the arms or the legs um, I, I'm I'm quite certain and pretty confident in saying that 
the good captain isn't uh, too cool with what we're doing in the building. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very, very active place, especially with Shadow Hallway. Oh, yeah. Can you yes. T yeah, we've had our experience with Shadow Hallway, and uh, you go ahead and tell some of the experiences that you might have had and other groups have. And I know me and you and Gavin all had an experience in the Shadow <laughs> Hallway during your interview. interview. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That was crazy. Um, you know, and the, the Shadow Hallway has always been – kind of this crossword puzzle that I'm constantly trying to solve, right? Um, right? I guess even when we first initially started to investigate and uh, first encountered what we now call just the shadow man, it's all the way down at the end of this very long hallway, uh, end of the hall, room number two, uh, this very tall black humanoid type figure is coming out of the room turning and then running at people at the other end of the hall. And it's interesting to me because in the amount of maybe, you know, 50 feet, it, it's traveling in less than a second. It is moving that fast. And obviously our natural reaction is to, to uh, flinch or duck or scream or what have you. Um, but the second we do that, the phenomenon's passed and it's done and over with. Um, so, it, it's almost suggesting a, a residual type haunt. Um, however, we can't necessarily put our fingers on when this is going to happen because it's happening at all times during the day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're trying to um, narrow it down even by season and it's not not really working for us as well. So now we're moving on to, you know, different weather patterns and weather condition uh, conditions, excuse me. Um, and hopefully we might be able to come up with something there. What was fascinating to me, like I said, we're always trying to put this puzzle together. Um, it was the day after that paranormal lockdown episode aired that I got a text message from a lady who used to work uh, at this place while it was uh, fully operational as that group home. She said, you're never going to believe this. And I was like, oh, well, try me, right? <laughs> and so uh, she says, in room two, there was a gentleman that would occupy that room who was six foot seven, a nonverbal patient. He was also mentally deranged and had killed two people in the past, okay? So here is a monster of oh, a wow. gentleman who cannot verbally convey emotions let alone process emotions like we can. Mm -hmm. He's simply acting upon them as he sees fit. Um, wow. He was absolutely no contact. You were not even supposed to help this gentleman put on his shoes. Um, it was that serious. Now, his claim to fame while he was there was whenever they were doing bed checks and rounds and things of that nature, he would come out of his room and chase who was ever doing the documentation. Um, this happened so often, in fact, that they had to put protocol in place as to what to do when this dude bum-rushed you because apparently it was a mathematical certainty it was going to happen. Right. So, um, right. They told everybody um, that if this were to happen, they were to drop what they were doing and run to the kitchen area, which is about half a house away, which to me is kind of ludicrous anyway because you never tell your employees to run anywhere. <laughs> right. That's a liability in and of itself. Um, but regardless, this gentleman would chase you as far as the kitchen. And he would never, though, he would always stop himself at the door frame. He would never cross that threshold into the actual kitchen itself. For whatever reason, we, we may never know. Huh. Very interesting stuff, though. So, yeah. Well, I know. Very interesting that we're seeing similar behaviors. Uh, with the shadow anomaly as this gentleman's behavior was in life. Yeah, I mean, the, the weird thing was is we were in shadow hallway and I set up a camera going down the, the general direction where Johnny Hauser uh, wound up getting rushed up on. And yes. um, Paula was by the, I guess the counter by the nurse's station and then she decided to go code blue code blue we have a code blue Heck and yeah. all of a Heck sudden yeah. you could hear Doo -doo 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 -doo. zoom something ran right between <laughs> us she lost her foot <laughs> ran into me 
I had a camera on me that wound up going all over the freaking place. And, yeah. oh, my God, it was just totally unbelievable. We felt it. And um, Joe went ahead and dug into the footage. And sure enough, he could see the shadow darting straight on down the hall while we got split wow. apart. So Wow. Yeah, that was... It blew my mind. I mean, we felt it, <laughs> and she yeah. she about lost it. It's it's funny to me because it's almost like now, now that the story's kind of out there, right? And mm -hmm. a lot of people kind of know about this. Obviously, when they go into that hallway, their main focus is down that general direction towards room two. Yep. However, now it seems that people are getting rushed up on or very very similar what you were just describing like those that footsteps and mm -hmm. the running yep. um coming from seemingly behind them mm -hmm. uh, where their back is is now turned right um which is equally terrifying i guess for a lot of people um it's so, a yeah that 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 hallway has sent more people running out that front door <laughs> than anything else i swear <laughs> oh yeah i mean i'm sitting there trying to grab my footing as she runs into me and i'm wind up into that one wall <laughs> and she's like did you feel that i'm like oh yeah i mean i just can't wait for that episode to come out because it was just amazing and of course we can't forget when we were doing our interview with you you're you're sitting there talking about the malvern man and you hear the doop, doop, and you yeah. told you told your brother to go ahead and check you think there's someone at the front door he goes to the front right. door ain't nobody there and then you start talking again we hear it even louder and then i believe your wife said it's coming from the segway which is over in shadow hallway so next thing you will right. you guys all go over there i go out with uh i guess with your brother to go look around the, the property to see if there's somebody banging on the windows right. and we found nothing but it is so <laughs> predominant that we actually heard that Every single camera picked it up. Our digital recorders picked it up. Even the mic on you picked it up. <laughs> right, right. So it's so amazing, man. It's so amazing. That was crazy. Well, I got. It's just good to know that, like, all that audio's there because now we know that we didn't lose our minds. We didn't hallucinate <laughs> anything. Right? Well, there was so. just too many witnesses. I think yeah. there was way too many witnesses right there. So. Yeah, we had too yeah, no many kidding, witnesses. No kidding. What were you gonna say? I said someone posted and said Josh had a birthday earlier this month. Was wondering if he enjoyed his boo cake. You had a boo cake? Oh, that's I know. Okay, look, that's Glidden. That's David Glidden. That son of a. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. You tell Glidden, or he's listening anyway. I, yes, I he had, is. Uh, yes, I enjoyed the boo cake. <laughs> <laughs> guess there's an inside joke to that. Uh, must be. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Man. <laughs> now we're going to get into um, a couple of the other stories that's floating around there that's very famous. Um, is there, now, I get this Myra. Is it? Myra? You're talking about the girl yeah. that hung herself in the closet? Oh, yeah. uh, Inez. 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 I don't that's know why it. I said Myra. Yeah, yeah. Oh no. Um yeah, the story of Inez is interesting. And you know, we again, it's another one of those crossword puzzles that I'm constantly digging into. Mm -hmm. Um it was interesting because we know that her uh who was 12 years old at the time. Now back this is back in 1900, okay? So Inez is 12 years old. Her brother Otto is 8. Um they were outside playing. This is late December. In 1900, uh, right around Christmas time, uh, she says, you know, hey, I'm either cold or bored. Regardless, she says, I'm going upstairs. Mm -hmm. um, Otto says, I'm right behind you. And we know 10 minutes pass. Now, whatever happened in these 10 minutes is absolutely crucial to the story. However, we'll probably never actually know what really factually happened. We do know that Otto comes upstairs and he finds his sister hanging by her jump rope in the closet. Um, it kind of looks like a suicide. It kind of smells like a suicide. However, I, I'm just not buying it. You know, I don't buy the fact that she killed herself. Yeah, um, I don't either. Now, we do know that, uh, that her brother Otto tried to get her down. Um, however, he just, he couldn't. He wasn't strong enough. Um, now, we also know that he then ran to the grocery store 
which is coincidentally where aunt and uncle were working. Now, their aunt and uncle were also their adopted mom and dad at that time. Um, so he grabs them. Complete sheer dumb luck mm-hmm. grabs two doctors as well. Um, so the five of them rush back. They get her down. They try to resuscitate her. But, I mean, at that point, too much time had passed. You know, there was just no bringing her back. Now, this is a story that absolutely shocked the community. Um, and we have some new information even regarding then one of those doctors that helped uh, try to get her back mm-hmm. um, ended up actually committing suicide, not even like three weeks later commits suicide i mean so this must have really affected him on a very deep level sounds well. like it um crazy stuff guys so again like we're getting new information all the time um uh, and just trying to put the pieces together to you know it's very important to me that i don't present people with with bs you right. know um I'm I'm an investigator. I've you know I've been an investigator. That's how I started in 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 this field, um, and that's one thing that I am very very adamant about is I don't want crap to be presented to people. <laughs> so and that's also another reason why if you visit Malvern Manor, you'll notice that we haven't touched anything. Mm-hmm. Um, all the rooms are exactly the way that we found them, um, including you know the the clothes in the dresser drawers um, and the, the wheelchairs and things of that nature. Everything is still there um, exactly the way we found it. And I think that kind of adds a little more to the integrity of the place, especially from an investigative standpoint, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, it's just very important to me, all that stuff. Well, the last story I want to uh, approach on about Melbourne Manor is my very first experience of getting scratched there. <laughs> oh. oh, man, this is hilarious. I mean, I'm sitting there. I'm, <laughs> I'm filming her. She's talking to Hank. And all, yeah, of, oh, yeah. all, all of a sudden she goes, Oh, God, I feel a burning sensation on my back. I said, Yes, you got scratched. She goes, Although I'm not sharing your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go ahead and put my camera down and go a look, and sure enough, she had a scratch go- that was like directly under her bra strap, and it was a long wow. one too. Directly upset. I tell you what. Now you guys, you guys were in Hank's room when that happened, right? Yep. Yes, I was talking to Hank, and I guess Hank didn't appreciate me talking to him. Nope, he don't like you. Well, I tell you, like Hank, yeah, Hank just doesn't like females in in general. Um, he has a very big problem with with females and we're not exactly sure why that is um but yeah he does not enjoy the company of ladies at all <laughs> i guess mama was bad to him growing up probably I that's kind of what i <laughs> kind of what i was thinking as well but that was crazy i mean <laughs> she finally got scratched <laughs> oh man it finally happened <laughs> yeah yeah i mean we have been touched pushed Mm -hmm. tugged i mean just recently we were doing an investigation at a place that no one even knew was haunted until we actually went in there to start investigating it and it's uh, it's a courthouse in uh massac county out here out uh, in uh, illinois and we were doing facebook live which is really cool this is something i decided Mm -hmm. to to do she went ahead and grabbed her phone and she went off doing facebook live to show people around the courthouse and in the, the jails. I was actually charging batteries for my camera because they went dead. And I decided, well, what the hell? I'll go ahead and do a Facebook Live too. So we're both walking around yeah. with gimbals and we meet up toward the stairs and she goes, have you been down to the judge's chambers? And I'm like, no, where's that at? She goes, down here. So I'm like, well, let's go. So here we are, we're yeah. both following each other um, with our gimbals and our and our uh, phones on Facebook Live, and so whatever activity occurs, people that are viewing. I mean, we had close to thirty five people watching that night, and they actually witnessed so many uh, occurrences that happened. And one of them was me getting pushed down a flight of steps with a four hundred dollar gimbal in my hand. 
Oh, damn it. Yeah. That's not fun. No. That's not fun. No. People are like, what the heck happened? I'm like, I got pushed. They're like, well, we saw you go down at an angle. <laughs> so I have no <laughs> idea. What, I thought what he had tripped over something. So I had stopped and said, what's wrong? And I was trying to see if there was a cord or something there, and it wasn't. Yeah, so. no, uh-uh. I forgot what wow. the heck we were talking about. Next thing you know, I, I I didn't even feel it, though. That's the thing. I didn't feel it at all. And I could see where the heck I was going. But next thing you know, yeah. I, I was going down the stairs at an angle. I'm like, whoa, I don't think so. I had to slam myself <laughs> against the wall and kind of brace myself before I went flying down. But that was crazy. Yeah, that's scary stuff. That's scary stuff. Yes, it is. Now, to finish up on Hank. Yeah. Yeah. Is Hank a klepto? A klepto. Or a klepto. <laughs> that I don't know. <laughs> that I don't know. Um, I guess it's weird. Yeah, it maybe. He, he might be. Because um, we have had a few people uh, in the past that have, you know, the day after or a couple days later or whatever, they have, you know, emailed me and said, hey, we've been up. You know, we were in Hank's room. That's the only place this piece of equipment could be. Could you check for us, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I'll go up there. I'd, I'd never find anything. Um, but, no, it's, it's interesting. I wonder if he's got, like, a secret stash of, like, <laughs> ghost hunting gear now. <laughs> well, the, the weird Did you thing, lose something there? Well, the, the weird thing is, is uh, I was setting up a thermal camera and a full-spectrum camera going straight down Shadow Hallway. I placed it on one of the plastic chairs. And before that, I actually was out in the in the trailer in the command center, and I was talking to people live via Facebook. And I had a couple of people saying, "Hey, can we watch the DVR on Facebook Live?" And I'm like, "Sure, why not?" So I kind of yeah. brought down the bracket so the phone was actually right in front of the screen where you can actually watch the DVR. And I was like, "Here you guys go." So. I went back into the house, <laughs> yeah, and Paula came up with a snazzy idea to go ahead and pull up my Facebook Live on her phone while she's inside the house, so that way oh, she yeah. can see what's going on on the DVR system. Well, I was That's finishing up cool putting, the, yeah, I was finishing up putting the thermal camera up, press record, so that way I'm recording whatever it's seen, and she goes, Gavin. There's somebody rummaging through all your stuff on the table. I'm like, what? So I walk on over. Well, I didn't walk on. I ran on over to her. <laughs> sure enough, I'm looking at her phone, and I see a sh black figure crouch over the table. And it's like he's going back and forth like he's rummaging through all my stuff. And I'm like, oh, hell no. So mm -hmm. I took off like a beeline straight on out through the kitchen, out the door, and, and ain't nobody there. Nothing has been moved. Nothing has been touched. I asked people on Facebook, I said, did you see anybody on the DVR system? They're like, no. And I'm like, well, huh, okay. So later that night after we got done, um, I went ahead and checked the Facebook footage, nothing. Ran the DVR footage back, nothing. But I saw it on her freaking camera. Well, lo and behold, yeah, lo and behold, we were uh, packing everything up. I had everything all inside the trailer we're ready to go and i'm like okay something's missing where the hell is my lock couldn't find my lock anywhere so I, I do remember that <laughs> yeah. i do remember that and i wound up pulling all that crap back out and i'm like yeah where the hell Unpack is it the trailer yeah yeah so i had to zip tie the damn thing so we could get home and i want oh my gosh i wound up talking to cheryl and cheryl said oh yeah hank he's a club toe he goes, she's like, that was him hovering over your table. I'm like, no. She goes, oh, yeah. So I guess she comes up to the Melbourne Manor a lot. Yeah, she's been there for sure. She I mean, definitely spent some time in the house. Did she uh, spend any time up in Hank's room? <laughs> I, th I think she has. I know for a fact she has, actually. <laughs> I wonder, has she told you anything about about Hank I mean she can read the room and read Hank so I'm just curious yeah, um, the one time like that I was going through with her specifically we we really focused a lot on on the attic mm -hmm. and it was very interesting some of the things like um, she was pulling uh, or she was picking up on and it was very very like personal stuff towards me uh -oh. you know 
Um, oh yeah, I'm telling you, like, I think these, uh, these spirits know more about me than, than I do. Um, oh, geez. it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. Like some of the things that was coming out of her mouth. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, we'll have to, uh, talk to her about the Malvern Manor. We're actually going to have her and two other psychics on our show, uh, November 15th, is it? Yeah, November the 15th. Yeah, November 15th. So we're yeah, gonna, I saw that. That's going to be crazy. Three psychics in one show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That'll be great, though. Yeah, we're going to have Mary Barrett. We're going to have Cheryl Fletcher and Lori Johnson from Ghosts of Shepherdstown. So that's going to be pretty cool. Heck yeah. But uh, yeah, we definitely got to make our way back up to uh, Malvern because that was just one heck of a place. And We I'm, didn't really get to finish really completely investigating it because there was still a couple of more stories that we didn't really get to test on the theory of. What were the stories? Right. Was it Nelly or no? Nelly? That's old. That's old South Pittsburgh Hospital. Okay, I'm getting my stories mixed <laughs> up. Uh, the one, one where you had the lady in the room to where it was the downstairs. You had the one room where there's supposed to have been a mentally challenged young girl. So she is. Uh, that, I think that's Susie. Susie. And I, she's upstairs. She's right across from from Inez's room basically okay um the one it's the room with all the crayons and coloring books and stuff okay yeah she's she's interesting uh to me just because she's um you know from everything the nursing staff told us she was you know middle-aged um however you know mentally she was closer to the age of maybe eight maybe ten years of age tops um so we found a lot of like coloring books and activity books up there Mm -hmm. um and the the crayons and all of that um, what's interesting to me is the activity with her seems to be contained to the room, whereas many of the other spirits are, are fairly transient will follow you throughout the entire building and kind of mess with you all night long. She stays put, and we don't know exactly why that is. So um, she's she's fascinating to me. Hmm. Did we do an experiment in that room? I know we had a, a camera in Inez's room, but is that the other room we set up a camera we did a a static cam on both ways so that way we could see if anything walked down the hall i don't know if we did or not or if it was the captain's room i know that we carried oh that could be yeah well i'll tell you something that's really bizarre and weird um we set up a dr 701d which is a six channel digital mixer that has four xlr Mm -hmm. microphones and we placed that up in the hallway and we ran the microphones into four rooms nice and we left it there very nice yeah we didn't get a single thing recorded <laughs> nothing it's like they saw that and they're yeah. like mm, keep your mouth shut i ain't saying nothing <laughs> nothing it's interesting how that works sometimes i know it's just like, really bizarre yeah it's like i've done i've done very similar things where i've almost like i've placed a recorder up in the attic mm-hmm. um but i've i've hidden it right um, basically underneath that blanket that we have that covers the uh the old the, chimney right there. yeah the chimney um so i've yeah so i've hidden it um and it seems to almost do better when when they don't know what it's around um it's kind of funny how that works so you got to camouflage it well see that's the reason why I just, yeah basically that's the reason why i came up with the idea i'm going to start wearing my full spectrum glasses with yeah. the, because that way whatever i see it gets recorded so they you know the spirits wouldn't even know that it is a quote unquote camera because you're not seeing anything in your hand it's on my face right so i yep, actually been exactly. trying to do that i did that at old south pittsburgh hospital but uh the damn ir light died out on me <laughs> oh yeah it started oh, getting yeah. dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and gone i'm like jesus <laughs> what the heck now, any more stories that we haven't touched on on any of the spirits that are there that stands out? What's the, what about that one oh room where that chair is? There's that one, remember that one corner where you turn and there's a chair that just sits there? I actually oh, saw that chair. Yeah. I saw that chair move. It actually, like, kind of turned. Yeah. You've seen that before, haven't you? Absolutely. What's, what's fascinating to me about that chair um, in that room there um is when we were initially investigating, we had some very odd electromagnetic field like spikes mm-hmm. around that chair. Um, 
So it, it was kind of fascinating to me because it wasn't happening anywhere else within the room uh, except in the proximity of the chair. So we took the chair out of the room um, and put it in the hallway. And uh, again, the anomaly remained um, with that high EMF level specifically around that chair. So I, mm-hmm. me being me, I took that chair and I walked it all the way downstairs. Oh, you <laughs> pissed put something it, off. I put, the dang, I put the dang thing in the kitchen and <laughs> retested it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, again, the anomaly remained. Um, so this was, it was fascinating to me. So I was like, well, I think we may have something like maybe just attached to the chair itself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just took the chair right back to where I found it and placed it there, you know, but, uh, yeah, it's it's pretty interesting why or how even that can happen, you know? Well, we actually encountered something similar, but it wasn't EMF. We were at the St. Albans Sanatorium, and there's a room that's directly across from Jacob's room. And there was a chair in the center of the room. Temperature-wise, the whole room was, I believe, 50 degrees or something like that. Yeah, about 50 sure. or 60 degrees. The chair was 83. Holy crap. <laughs> and Holy see, crap. Yeah, and, and what I wound up doing, was, I was like, oh, well, I guess there must be some hothead sitting in that chair, you know? I, was just, I didn't think it was going to do anything, <laughs> but the next day, um, I was, we were shooting my intro about uh, St. Albans Sanatorium, and I'm just walking down this staircase. And I told the camera guy, I said, dude, I got to stop. I, I feel a sharp pain in my shin. I got kicked in the freaking shin. And when I stopped down. Oh, that's down, not even cool. Yeah, I stopped down at the stair, rolled my pant leg up, and you can see the red mark. <laughs> and it was getting redder and redder. Oh, my God. I guess I must have pissed something off up there. That's what I'm thinking it was. <laughs> like, ah, it happens. Whatever. <laughs> so, but, yeah, I mean. You actually get to check that out in the first episode. It's going to be coming out uh, Halloween of this year. It's going to be the St. Albans Sanatorium, and you'll actually see uh, me get kicked in the shin. <laughs> Could it? Nice. So, very, very cool. No, I'm looking forward to seeing that stuff, guys. Oh, yeah. We, we are just excited. It's finally here. It's been a long time coming. So it's been a lot of work, blood, sweat, tears, griping, bitching, complaining, <laughs> oh yeah and that's it, all the fun stuff yeah yeah <laughs> and it's finally almost here 13 days and it will be released we that's have so a cool, question man. congrats for, yeah we have a question for you from one of our listeners has he found any if it's, if it's david glidden i don't want to hear it <laughs> oh no this is somebody else this is somebody on uh okay. youtube uh, goes by the name okay. of haunting history has he found anything that's david glidden <laughs> oh is it <laughs> Yeah. Now, what's he say, though? Serious, David. Has he found anything on the name Teddy? Ted or Teddy. Ted or Teddy. Asking for a friend. <laughs> Asking for a friend. No, I have not. Not yet. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, I'm just going to do something here for uh, David as soon as she gets back. <laughs> yeah, I, I have no idea why he's asking about anything about a name Ted and Teddy asking for a friend. He said poop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, while she's going ahead and get the thing I'm talking about, uh, I got a question. Did you actually find out if that was really uh, bloody handprints on those walls up on the second floor? It is indeed. It is actually physical blood. So that those um, markings have been tested now in, for three separate sections of uh, of that hallway. Uh-huh. Three different tests were conducted on those uh, on those places. It was interesting uh, because each time it did come back positive for human blood. However, it was also um, found out that whoever left all the blood in the hallway was the same person. Oh, um, okay. I got so you. that's it's pretty interesting stuff. Hey, David, here you go. But we don't know any lawyers. All our friends make sandwiches. Oh. I'm going to get a huge <laughs> migraine in the parking lot in about 20 minutes. Hey, wait, wait, hang on. i got to post this. Hashtag uh, Mondays. 
Look what's in my hand. Look what's in my hand. It is Ted. Oh, Lord. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, I just had to do that since he was asking about Ted. Well, you know what? I have a Ted. <laughs> Heck, yeah. Oh, man, that was crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I was just kind of curious about that because I remember when we were doing our walkthrough that uh, you mentioned that that was actually bloody handprints on the wall. Now, see, that kind of brings me to, you notice how throughout all the years it has not gone anywhere. It's still there. It's like imprinted into that wall, into the wood. Right, now, right. You know, they had that story about the uh, Myrtle's Plantation where they said the guy wound up uh, getting shot. It was Mr. Winters said that he got yeah. shot on the porch. He was in the front. Yep, he was like in the front or up on the porch, and then didn't he go up the steps and basically yeah. died in his wife's arms, didn't he? Yeah, well, see, here's the thing. They, quote, unquote, they say he dragged his lifeless body through the parlor up the steps to die in his wife's arms. Okay, uh, red flag number one, lifeless body? Mm -hmm. How do you drag a lifeless yeah, body? Yeah, that is <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> and besides that, <laughs> if poor he, wording choice there. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and besides that, if you're losing a lot of blood from getting shot, first of all, that mm -hmm. trail is going to be on the porch. It's going to be going yeah. through the parlor, which would be seeping through the carpet. If it was wooden floor, it would be going through the wood, and it would mm -hmm. also be going up the stairs. But there is none of that anywhere. Right. Right. And it just kind of takes me to the same thing. You got the blood still on the walls, and it's been there for years. It does not disappear. So that leads right. me to believe that my theory about him dragging himself across the floor is false because it doesn't even matter if the blood was actually in the wood and years pass by. If you put carpet over, it's going to seep up and stain that carpet. Yeah. So, sure. yeah, when Mr. Winters got shot, he got shot and died on the porch yeah. in his own pool of no, blood. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the reason why yeah, I, I mean, oh, brought e that up. <laughs> either that or, yeah, like he, uh, either that or, uh, yeah, he was probably dead before he hit the ground, honestly. I mean, if you want to yeah. get blunt about it, you know. Yeah. Like, but, yeah, it was probably right there on that porch. Well, I'm st I still don't know exactly where he got shot. I'm thinking he got shot in the abdomen and collapsed okay. on the porch and just died in his own pool of blood because, you know, you just pour out like nobody's business. Now, think about it. You're pouring out a lot of blood and you go dragging? <laughs> no. Well, also, I looked yeah. up no newspaper articles and it does show I have a newspaper article that states that he did die on the front porch. See? Oh, there you go. And yep. it was over an ex, her his wife. Well, it wasn't actually his wife; it was his fiance, and it was over a loving a lover's spell ah. involving two men. Okay, goodness, that, guys, come on! Really, <laughs> we got to talk about Brokeback Mountain now? Right, no, we're talking <laughs> come on, gents. Jeez! All right, David <laughs> said the name Ted comes from the Paranormal Studies pilot that he shot there over a year ago. True that, and it is, it is very, very interesting stuff. So, I know this, but I'm not sure if any of the uh, listeners know this. And you did kind of mention it during the beginning. You also said you are a filmmaker, and you have two films that you have uh, re recently shot and, and uh, produced. Yeah. So, I think, my gosh. This is now eight documentary films, I think, that I've done. Holy cow, that's um, a lot. Yeah, it's been it's been a crazy trip. Now the like the first uh, the first movie was called A Brush with Evil, and it's basically taking my first book and kind of retelling that story in the book, and then taking it about five steps farther. Um, the book and the and the film kind of complement each other mm -hmm. in in different ways. Um, now the second A Brush with Evil film was completely shot at uh, Malvern Manor. Okay. So very very interesting stuff. Now I will go ahead and say like A Brush with Evil three is definitely in the works. All right, <laughs> and, awesome. Uh, and all of that fun stuff. I know I've seen the first um, one. I haven't one. seen the second one yet. Oh yeah, the the third one is definitely going to be, I think, the the final 
the final in all of this. Um, but yeah, just wrapped up filming, gosh, man, just like two, three weeks ago, um, with David Glidden. <laughs> um, <laughs> that name's going to haunt you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we traveled to a few different places kind of in search of what we call the spook light, um, phenomenons, which it's it's interesting to me because all these uh, disembodied type lights that are appearing out of nowhere and almost seem in some cases to have some form of intelligence mm-hmm. to them. Um, now this is a phenomenon that I that David and I both uh, think that it really hasn't got a fair shake in all of this because it's not uh, it's not a demon it's not a a ghost that, or it's not the stereotypical lady in white it's not uh you know something that you see on television or anything like that right, so, right. um we we figured this would be a good opportunity for us to really kind of bring this uh to the forefront and maybe get a, a few more people kind of looking in the direction um of some of these claims so mm-hmm. hmm that's interesting. Yeah. Very, very interesting stuff. Like, the last place that we went was in North Carolina. We were up in the, on Brown Mountain, and I was absolutely terrified. But I, <laughs> we were, okay. We were, <laughs> I'm telling you, man, like, it was it was so fascinating to me um, to put ourselves in these locations. We were camping in these locations. Mm-hmm. Um digging up all the history to try to either prove or disprove any type of claim. Um, it was so much fun. It was a lot of work <laughs> and um, it's it's really cool to I, I just can't wait to share with everybody what we actually saw and captured on multiple devices. <laughs> oh, that's the way to do it. Fascinating. That's the way to do it. Get it on multiple devices. You know, one device is, yeah. is highly questionable, but when you go ahead and get it on multiple, you know, without a shadow of a doubt. Right, right. But, you know, we like to go ahead and travel all over the place. We've been all over the south. We've been to the far reaches, well, actually, the far west to uh, the Queen Mary in Anaheim, uh, Long oh, Beach, absolutely. California. You know, and we've been to the USS Lexington and Corpus Christi and all the way up to St. Albans and. Ashmore Estate, Melbourne Manor, Monroe House, and we have been like all over the place. And I mean, we actually wanted to go ahead and put together uh, a documentary on all the places we've been to. Man, that thing would like last four hours. It'd be have to be a mini series. Yeah, <laughs> that's always the worst part of it is like cutting and splicing and all of that. Like if if a brush with evil would have been what I wanted it to be, like it would probably be over three hours in length. Like it, the story is just so massive. Yeah. You know, everything yeah. like just even the build up is massive in and of itself. Um, crazy, crazy stuff. But yeah, it's like, it's, it's so weird to get it into, uh, the programs, you know, the editing programs and mm-hmm. start to cut and splice. And it's almost like you're, you know, tearing apart your own child like it's <laughs> terrible <laughs> right it's like oh i don't need that part well what about that one i might need that yeah nope <laughs> exactly Cutting and then you floor. watch the finished cut and then and then you're like physically ill you know <laughs> right? like, oh god are people gonna like this yeah well yeah it's kind of like what happened with our show i mean we've got we at the location from you know saturday into sunday and we're filming for like 24 hours and we're knocking it all down to like one hour and i'm just <laughs> like well we got you know a lot of stuff but you really can't cram that in so we're gonna have our one hour episode but when the blu-ray comes out we're gonna have our two hour of the uh, episode we'll actually show more stuff which we couldn't cram in because yeah, yeah that's I, the way I, to do it yeah i mean i definitely can relate to that because it's like you want to show more stuff, but you're you got this time limit you got to deal with, and oh damn. <laughs> so, well, hey, uh, go ahead and tell our listeners and viewers how where they can actually uh, catch up with you. Uh, 
uh, schedule to book the Malvern Manor. And if you happen to be at any, uh, let's see, events for the rest of the year, or conventions and things like that. Yeah. Um, so if they wanted to see some more about Malvern Manor, they can go to uh, Facebook is the best place, obviously, first off. Mm -hmm. um, if they cruise there, they'll be able to uh, see some footage, see some things like that. Um, but then they'll also be able to click right to the website. Um, and so on the website, they can look at the calendar of different things that we got going on, uh, pick a date if they want. If you guys request a date, um, it emails me directly. So oh, cool. um, as far as booking and anything like that, you're dealing with me uh, personally. So okay. um, it's a lot of fun. But then if they wanted to check out any of uh, my films or... Uh, podcasts or anything like that. If they just went to joshherd.net, mm -hmm. then they'll be able to find all my books and films and all that fun stuff. <laughs> wow. How many books you got out? I've written six books so far. Good Lord, I can't even write one. <laughs> oh, dude. Waiting on it Paul to write hers. Yeah, she's supposed to be writing hers. It is an absolute sort nightmare. Of <laughs> You've been working on too many projects in the foot. <laughs> well, are you, yeah. are, are you trying to say you have as many hats as he does? Probably. Oh, okay. I oh. carry about six of them at my job alone. <laughs> yeah. Two yeah. of them I didn't ask for. <laughs> That's the way it goes. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Malvern is an amazing place and everybody should visit sometime. That's from David. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Well, I'm definitely going to go ahead and check out your site because I need to uh, catch myself up. I've already seen A Brush with Evil 1. You let me see that uh, a long time ago, but I haven't seen uh, the second one yet, so I need to... No, I'll send it over to you, man. Oh, cool. I need to check that one out. Heck yeah. So, well, hey, man, we appreciate you being on the show tonight and giving everybody information about the malvern manor and of course all the stories and stuff so a lot of people listening can actually be like hey you know that really cool i want to go check it out i'm gonna take my team over there we're gonna buck it and uh, we're gonna investigate and see if we can uh, talk to hank and possibly get scratched <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> but i appreciate you guys having me on tonight thank you so much hey man no problem you have yourself a good evening yeah you do the same thank you all right bye-bye bye-bye all right, folks, there you go. Josh Hurd, Malvern Manor, awesome place to go to. You've heard the stories. Now go ahead and book the place so you can investigate it yourself. What? Nothing. Look like you're about to say something. No. Oh. One thing you definitely want to try to do is when you go there, do code blue. Say code blue, code blue, code blue while you're in Shadow Hallway and see what happens. Or nothing else, pretend like you're making rounds to knock on the door. Because that's exactly what we actually did. We went down and not, I went and knocked I didn't on, do anything. I was with the camera. Yeah, but <laughs> I'm just getting it. I went to each door and I knocked on it. And as if, you know, you know how nurses do when they go to visit, they knock. Mm -hmm. And then they go around. And uh, then when I got done is when we just, I waited a couple of seconds. And then that's when I did the cold blue thing. Uh, well, I know after we got done with that incident and we got rushed and uh, we kind of grabbed the cameras and hurried our asses on down the hallway to go back out toward the kitchen. Um, later, I went back in there with my camera, and I think you were with me too, um, when I took the gimbal in there and I started filming stuff in like different rooms where the bathrooms were, where the beds were and stuff like that. Kind of had that eerie feeling that somebody was like walking behind me at the same time I was shooting it. Although, I don't really remember you there. I think you weren't there. Well, I think it was I, just me. I think I stayed anywhere that was warm because it was cold there. I think you were in the kitchen sleeping. Oh. Uh, actually, no. I was in the kitchen trying to watch out for because the other story was, which I was going to... What was the other uh, story? Uh, for Josh, was about the kitchen cabinets, and it did. Oh, yeah. The kitchen cabinets actually opened. Yes. I yes. sat there, and I watched I remember it. that. And then I was, like, sitting there, and then all of a sudden, you know, I was having the, an EVP session in the kitchen. And, and yeah, it was, like, 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and it was one of those deals. If you, For me, if you're investigating from, like, 9 o'clock at night until all, straight through until about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm, I, I'm at the point of, you know, I'm, I'm still wanting to investigate, but I'm tired at the same time. 
So I'm sitting there and I, I, I have my head I, I have my head kinda on the cabinet in the little counter space right there. I had a there. thermal camera on you too. Get you. And I'm over here going, okay, and I'm asking questions and then you know, I wait a few minutes, and then I'm okay. Slowly, you know, I'm trying to get somebody to open that cabinet door across the way. It was the one underneath the sink. Yeah, and I was like, any of them. I don't care. Just do one of them. And then I'm over there, and then all of a sudden, I, 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 I kind of like dozed off for a second. And in the meantime, I'm me dozing. I, and I'm not really dozing. I'm in between. I'm there and I'm not dozing, but you're like closing your eyes and you're you are in a trance state. Uh, yeah, and all of a sudden you hear the click, as if because he he has those little latching systems mm -hmm. on his cabinets. So if you open it, you hear that little that little tick click or whatever you call it. And uh, all I know is is that when I popped it. It, or, or I heard it pop, it made me wake back up going, okay, something just happened. Then I get up and I walk over there, and sure enough, that cabinet's open. I said, did you have to wait till I fell asleep in order for me to get, you know. So, yeah, and I played that game a couple of times, and they, they opened that cabinet at least a couple of times that night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you actually could hear the little click, because like she stated, it, it, it was a little clasp and went, so... There was something else that kind of got me is uh, going into, going through that one room where we did the interview with Josh and his brother when you have to move that blanket out of the way and yeah. you go toward the staircase when we kind of walked around the staircase going up. It looked like that there was something um, right when we made the, the, the corner, made the turn. It looked like there was somebody down there looking up at us. Remember I told you that? I said, I think there's someone down there. Oh, I, I I don't remember that. I just know what creeped me out besides the attic wasn't, well, not necessarily Hank's room. Hank's room just pissed me off after he scratched <laughs> me. But um, <laughs> the part of, there were those two rooms, and I meant to ask Josh about them to retell me the story because I don't remember exactly what he told me. I could keep Josh on there for an hour. I can see that now. But anyway... <laughs> What creeped me out was the two rooms that were across the hall from each other. And it had the story about one you could fit. Yeah, one. Inez and the other girl. No. No? No, the one like you're going to go up that big long hallway after you pass Hank's room. Like we're going to go towards the attic. Okay. There's this one room on one side and one room on the other side. I think that's where we put the shadow cameras at. I knew there was two rooms that we did that at. Uh, that's the rooms that we put the shadow cameras in, because that's the one where they said they've caught somebody leave one room and go across the hallway and go in the other room. That's right. Josh, do you remember that? I don't know if you're still watching, but yeah, we're talking about that one room that was next to each other. One room's here, one room's over here, and you actually had a shadow to walk from one room to the other. That's the one we actually set up our static cameras in. Yes, that's it. The rape room. 17 and 18. Yeah. It was the orderly that went in there, I believe, that went ahead and uh, raped the girls. No, I think it was a guy raped a guy. Excuse me? He was a molester. Uh, oh, that's just weird. That's just weird and wrong at the same time. I'm gonna have to ask Josh that. And see but what. I'm pretty sure it was a male, and the, the gentleman. It says Paul is correct. Ah! <laughs> it was a guy from 17 who raped a guy in 18. Oh my God! That's just wrong. But yeah. Some broke back mountain shit in the hospital. Yeah, but I don't think I think the other guy had a mobile had a, was not very mobile or was insecure or something he had a lot of I think the guy that he was abusing had a mental uh, ability you know a stability to where he was not you know that's I messed up yeah wow okay yes I do remember that we did set up a camera we d we did a static camera in seventeen and a static camera in eighteen. And I'm trying to think if we put the horizontal periscope in 18 and the vertical in 17 in the thresholds. I don't remember. I just have to look at the footage again. But I'm thinking 
Yep, it turned out that they were lovers. The rape was recorded because the staff wasn't happy about things. Oh, lovely. Bow, 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 bow. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, damn, that was bad. Wow, wow, wow. That's just... That's crazy. Well, see, I started thinking about the, the rape thing, too, but that was also done over at the Edinburgh Manor, I believe. It's almost the same type of thing. I think that happened at Edinburgh Manor. Because, uh... I'm trying to think who the heck... Well, uh, you gotta think about this. And, 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 you know, you're looking at a facility that has carried mental patients and, and different types of... I mean, you know, Josh said here and said criminals right. and, and all different types of aspects of life and most of these places like uh, Ashmore States, uh, St. Albans uh, Edinburgh Manor uh, right. Randolph County Asylum that we're fixing to go see in December there is going to have to be some kind of mental stability uh, 150 of documented occurrences that was at Malvern Manor? Yeah. Yeah, I told you about that. Holy crap. I told you about the health department coming in and finally closing them down and and, it, and everything. And I found the report on it. Um, anyway, make a long story short, I mean, every one of these facilities were understaffed, over, you know, full to the max, some of them over the max, and you only had... a you know, one or two doctors, you know, three the max of, uh, that are taking care of all these patients. And so it, it's amazing that you cannot watch and see every single thing that happens. Things happen. And it do come unnoticed. I mean, I've heard horror stories of different locations of some of them tying the women to bed in the beds and having the men have their ways with the women because of uh, that would keep them from being angry and violent patients. And I mean, I've heard some wow. strange stories. I've heard some crazy stories. And that sounds like a scene from Chucky. And, I mean, I've read different kinds of stories across the United States, outside of the United States, of some of the strangest things that happen in some of the, in asylums, in, uh, men, in mental hospitals, in uh, strange uh, different kinds of locations that involved anything to this expensity. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's out there. Mm -hmm. So, it makes you just, uh, you know, wonder, you know, what any kind of you know stability it can be i mean hmm my question is is how many uh, doctors and nurses did they actually have on staff at the malvern manor was it like they had more patients than they had doctors and nurses oh i'm surely in the early times of and i and actually melbourne manor at the time when uh, it was into a you know a hospital before it was a mental hospital or not a mental hospital but uh, a boarding house for mental and uh, in instability patients um, right. it was called Nishna Cottage or Nershna Nershna Cottage I remember that yeah yeah and uh, and I did find some articles in a newspaper that showed that uh, how much it cost to go to Nar Nershna and that there was uh, I had found some uh, of, uh, articles on some of the people that were there. There was a father and son there that was put, both that were put there. Um, he was an Alzheimer's patient. The son had, uh, was one of those that he couldn't live by himself. And so they put him there. And they were supposed to have been in only a couple of rooms apart according to the article that I read. And, uh, and, uh, it, it's interesting that, uh, you know, and, and there's all different kinds of stories. There's, a st and there's the, there's different articles I found. And then there's, uh, you know, some of the past nurses that were there. I found names and associations and stuff with it. And, 
And I mean, I'm thinking, you know, they probably had one nurse to ten patients, probably. Good Lord. By some of the records that I found. That's just a rough estimate. I mean, because nowadays, I don't know what everybody's hospital standards are, but I know at our local hospital, one nurse has five patients. Yeah, sounds about right. Well, no, well... Well, I know when I when I worked at Lourdes, they had one nurse for one side, so they were actually like twelve patients, twelve or thirteen, and then you had a nurse for the other side. They didn't really take you know a whole floor; they actually took one side. So you had one like nurse grabbing this whole side, and then you had a nurse grabbing that other side. Then when you go across from the nurses' station. It's the same thing. You got another nurse grabbing that whole side, and he, another nurse grabbing that yeah, side. So four nurses for four sides. Yeah, is what so, they do. Yeah, and that one side was usually about five or six rooms. Twelve. And you had They're about twelve. Mm. Yeah, I wired all the rooms. I should know. Oh, <laughs> well, it, I just it know. Was twelve. <laughs> well, I know at the other hospital, I think it's five or six patients because they break their hall. Of course, each hospital has their own standards. Yeah. So. But that's how uh, Lourdes worked. I, I know that much. Yeah, and just that one case with the two guys. Oh, okay. Well, we went far beyond that conversation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. So, man, we're getting down to the wire. We got five minutes left. So I hope you all enjoyed the show tonight. It was really cool. We had a blast. What are you doing? Oh, nothing. I'm just trying to resituate myself. You're trying to what? Resituate myself. Resituate yeah. yourself. Okay, one last shout out. Um, Desiree just messaged and posted that just one hour ago they got power back in Puerto Rico. All right, I got power and in Puerto Rico. And that's since the last hurricane came through. Yeah. They have been without power. They just got power back, but 83% of Puerto Rico is still without power. Damn. Nobody, hardly anybody can do dialysis or anything. The hospital is on emergency pack. They did get the hospital to be the first one up yeah, and running. Yeah, I was going to say, the hospital will be the first one to grab power. Yeah, so they did get them up. But yeah, I just saw a message to where Desiree said, they just got power an hour ago. Because she's cow. been going to the hospital with her husband trying to get her phone charged every day. Wow. Yeah, so. That is crazy. All right, well, guys need to remember there's only 13 more days until the release of the Paranormal Journey to the Unknown Season 1 comes out as a new original series on Amazon. So, Halloween, jump on Amazon and check out the episode. First episode is the St. Albans Sanatorium, second one is Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, third one is Jailhouse Pizza, and the fourth one is the infamous Monroe House. So, we would have had more episodes for the first season, but we had issues with a, a server due to the lovely hurricane. So, we lost a lot of stuff. Um, we actually have to go back and reshoot uh, interviews um, and also reshoot some B rolls. We have the investigations already still done, so that's a good thing. So, we have all that lined up. We just need to get the interviews and get some more b-rolls and possibly some drone shots for the other episodes so season two be on the lookout for it it should be probably march 2018 and i believe we're going to have at least 12 episodes in season two so with that in mind i'm going to go ahead and close out we're going to say good night you guys have yourself a good evening and uh, until next time keep ghosting we'll talk to you later see ya <laughs>